Hello everyone, it's Sarah from Sassy Reads and I am bringing you a reading vlog on the rest of Lilith's Brood. I finally decided to pick this up even though it's like, what, we've got like five days left in March and I was like, let's just see if we can finish this. I think maybe I can, I don't know. I've read a lot of adulthood rights today. But before I jump in to my thoughts, I want to do a quick little book haul of some books that I've recently acquired over the last couple days. Um, I got Dare to Bloom, Trusting God Through Painful Endings and New Beginnings by Zim Flores. Um, this is the author, Zim Flores. Um, this book, stunning. Um, it's got like photographs in it and it's just beautiful. So I can't wait to read this. I have never heard of Zim before. I never even heard of this book before. I saw it on Amazon and I was like, dare to bloom, trusting God through painful endings and new beginnings. This is me right now. Um, I don't know, it's just, I'm in this weird transitional season and I feel like this book would be really comforting and inspiring. And I love anything in reference to God and flowers because that's how God speaks to me. And I need to bloom right now so i'm excited for this one and also can we talk about like how beautiful she is i hardly ever see um black authors in christian nonfiction, and i think that that's such a sad thing and it's so exciting whenever i do find one because i'm like oh yes somebody that's not a white blonde woman and like this is a recurring joke between like me and all my friends that if you like go to a Mardell's or any Christian bookstore you'll pick up the back of a cover to see what the author looks like and you will very find like very rarely find someone who doesn't fit a certain quota and you know it's it's definitely a thing so super excited for this one and I just I think Thomas Nelson they did a great job with this book it's it's beautiful they also published Lisa Turkus Turkers I love Lisa Turkers um, I think her stuff is really good. I also purchased um, the trilogy. I don't even know what this trilogy is called. I just wanted to get it because Fog. And I remember Fog was mentioned in Paperbacks from Hell by Grady Hendrix. And so I was like, yeah, I want to read a book about Fog. Um, but now that I'm looking at Fog, Snow, and Fire, I don't think that it's about what I think it's about. But I'm still excited for this, even though I have a hit or miss history with Caroline B. Cooney. When I was younger, I read the Face on the Milk Carton series. Even though I hated them so much, I just, I didn't like the first book. I hated the second book. I liked the third book and I didn't like the last book. So I have like this tumultuous relationship with the Face on the Milk Carton books, but I did like Code Orange by her. So I'm curious and I will give this a shot. And then I got another Grady Hendrix book. I got My Best Friend's Exorcism. I think this is the last um, fiction book that I have that I have not read by him um, to own. I just bought a copy of We Sold Our Souls, which I'm excited about. I've read Horror Store, Paperbacks from Hells, The Southern Guide to um, Slaying Vampires, which I don't own a copy of because I listened to the audiobook, which I highly recommend. But I'm excited. I love this cover. Quark Books has great horror covers, and I just love how it looks like an old VHS. And it even says, Be kind, please rewind on it. It's just great. So I'm excited for that one. And um, if you didn't watch my last reading vlog, I reviewed, um, let me grab this. Okay. The Women of Weird Tales. And I became obsessed with one writer named Everell Worrell. So I actually found out from a review on Goodreads that this book was published in 2020, like before The Women of Weird Tales was published. And this is like the first ever like collected edition of her book. I don't even know who the publisher is. I It sounds like it was put together by a, like one person because it says copyright Angela J. Meyer. I don't know who you are, Angela, but like, thank you for this. I have read five of these stories because five of them were in this collection, but I have a bunch of Everill War stories that I haven't read and call not their names, which I'm so excited about. This is the back and I cannot wait. 
I because I just I love her short stories I think she's so good and I also in that review I saw on Goodreads he mentioned this book that was published called Masters of Horror Volume 1 um Allison V Harding the Forgotten Queen of Horror 16 Terrifying Tales um and the back says, who was Allison V. Harding? Allison Harding's real name was Jean Milligan. She was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1919 and passed away in 2004. Not much is known about her personal life, but one thing we do know is that you couldn't pick up an issue of Weird Tales from 1943 to 1950 and not come across one of her stories. Not every Harding story is cl a classic, but most of them have a very high batting average and some of them are for or true forgotten classics. Aim your reading glasses at tales like The Frightened Engineer, The Coming of M. Malkerhoss, Scope, The Underbody, and The Murderous Steam Shovel, and you'll see why. This is the first published collection of Allison V. Harding's works, and, but it certainly won't be the last. And so these are two weird tales writers super excited about. I want to get as many weird tale ladies books as possible because they write really interesting stuff and I love reading old school horror stuff that isn't written by men um because I I will read stuff by men but I just prefer to read short stories by women um because I find I connect with them on a better level and they don't have the extreme racist overtones that H.P. Lovecraft set into the horror genre which is like a whole different topic and not even like a subgenre like his racism pushed into cosmic horror so badly that most of the cosmic horror we have today has these really overt racist overtones of otherness and they're like oh these aliens are actually like representation of groups of people which most people don't know but i i did some digging into his background and history because i wanted to know who he was because when i read him when i was in high school i didn't do that I didn't know about it and then um I think I started doing more research not long after I heard about the Ballad of Black Tom coming out which I still have yet to read I need to buy a copy of that book um but I read Lovecraft Country which I have issues with because Lovecraft Country is written by a white man but it talks about like segregation um and I just think that the novel could have hit a lot more points if you know it was written by a black author like the, Black, the Ballad of Black Tom is, um, so, and I wasn't also a fan of Lovecraft Country in general, like, I thought it was kind of boring, um, and it reminded me too much of H.P. Lovecraft style, which I either jive well with or I don't, so, if you have any short story collections of women, um, whether it's sci-fi, horror, or fantasy that you want to recommend me, I am down for that, but let's go back to the queen of science fiction like you cannot convince me that octavia e butler is not the queen of science fiction i've read um let me grab these real quick i'm gonna just scoot over here and move these can candles i may hear some books that drop okay so i was first introduced to octavia e butler when i read parable of the sower for a class in college on post-apocalyptic books which is like one of my genres i love post-apocalyptic fiction and while this one technically isn't like an end of the world story it definitely has intense elements of post-apocalyptic because we see a degrading society in which violence escalates and um we follow lauren Olamina as her family is trapped behind a gated community trying to survive a very violent world and when that world is destroyed she has to embark and leave her home and she starts um a new religion called earth seed and it's all about planting yourself in the stars and their goal is to one day go up into space and have a colony of humans in the stars and parable of the talents the sequel i read this one last summer in 2020 and I loved it more than Parable of the Sower. Parable of the Sower, like, it's really good, 4.5 stars. Parable of the Talents, 5 stars, beautiful, stunning, rip my heart out and, like, shove it down my throat kind of pain. And I love that about Octavia E. Butler. She tackles humanities in this way that you hate it, but also you love being human, but also, like, you really hate it. 
and like Lauren Olamina was like a really interesting character to follow because like the whole time I read this I was like she's starting a cult like super suspicious I read this and I was like oh yeah she definitely started a cult and then I was like oh my god these people are tor torturing her who cares if it's a cult like they're degrading these people in their concentration camps my heart hurts for them and it's just I love these books and it hurts my heart that Earthseed never got to be finished because Octavia E. Butler hit like a huge writing, um, what's it called? Not ghostwriter, a uh, writing block. She had a lot of writing block with Earthseed and I've read that there are like five different manuscripts, um, of the third Earthseed novel that has never been finished. My dream, you guys, is that someone will publish those unfinished manuscripts because I love Octavia E. Butler so much. I don't even want to read, read finished stuff. I just want to read everything that woman ever wrote. She's amazing. So Lilith's Brood. Um, this is ex exogen Xenogenesis, I think it's called. Um, the first book was Dawn. Gave that one 4.25 stars. Liked it. I thought Lilith is a very strong woman and I love her character. I love the tension that we have with being awakened on this alien spaceship and the tension of like, you want to use my body to harvest and create a new life that is not human. And I'm not sure if I'm down from that. And then having to also wake up other humans and then see humans suck, start murdering each other. And it's it just goes downhill very quickly. The ending of Lilith's uh, Brood, Dawn, the first book, fantastic. I really loved the ending for Dawn. And it sets up a good sequel for Adulthood Rights. However, Adulthood Rights picks up, I don't know how long after, um, because I'm pretty sure when Lilith wakes up and by the time Dawn ends, it's probably been about 10 years. And so she's probably in her 30s. In Adulthood Rights, she says that she's like 53, I think. And so it's been like a huge jump. She has a lot of kids at this point, but we're following her son, Akeen. In my head, before he like pronounced it out, lo out loud, I read it as Akin. His name is Akeen. And so Akeen um, is the first ever male to be born between a human woman and the Okanali alien race um and he will most likely be a male like he he's not gonna be like the ulio or uloi i know i don't know how to say this if i was listening to an audiobook i could pronounce these words correctly but we're just gonna butcher them and hope that i understand i understand what i'm saying but you probably don't but there's like this third um gender of the Okanali where they have male, female, and then they have the Ulio or Ulioi. And they're like this, they're the gender that can, like they can't have children without all three being there. And the gender is like neither male nor female. Um, they're like past gender basically. Um, and so he is like this anomaly because before him, the aliens were only allowing them to breed females and so Akeen is like the perfect looking human child because normally the girls look very much like the aliens and humans hate them and they kidnap them from the um families um and force them I guess to live this human lifestyle and at this point in the second book it's established that humans suck and i am on page 384 chapter 16 in part two and i can confirm that humans suck um akeen this is not a spoiler because on the adulthood rights like summary on goodreads that and you know like he's gonna get abducted and he does get abducted and it sucks because Akeen has to leave his mother, Lilith, and his family. And he is now trapped with two characters who turned on Lilith and Dawn. Like, they were her friends. And now they are watching her child, um, Gabe and Tate. 
and I hate Gabe because I think he has really dark motives. And Tate, um, while I liked her in Lilith's Brood, by the end, not Lilith's Brood, in Dawn, by the end of Dawn when I saw how she treated and didn't come to Lilith's defense, I was like, mm, she's not to be trusted. And so, yeah, I have mixed feelings towards these two people and I'm like, ah. Out of all the people that Akeen could be with in the Phoenix group, and Phoenix is like this group of people who are basically trying to rebuild humanity, even though they can't reproduce because you humans can no longer reproduce unless they have an uli, an ulio, I can't say that word, the third gender, unless they have a mate, um, they can't produce just male and female human anymore it will not work like they the aliens have come cut that off and so they still have these dreams and these fantasies and they're starting to build guns and weapons and humans just suck they kill each other there's like they they kidnap women and sell them into slavery and at this point i'm like this is why humanity was extinguished in this first novel we learn that dawn opens up and the whole human race has pretty much been wiped out due to the nuclear explosions and it's like humans are horrible because they have this intense desire for hierarchical living where they have someone on top and then someone on the bottom and it just so happens that the women in this world are constantly sexually assaulted and it pisses me off because i'm like you guys like what why the aliens know these things why do you let them do this just kill all of them don't even bring them back to the ship just kill all of them like that's how i feel about the humans they're not good people there is nothing redeeming about them at all and i'm just sitting here like akeen cannot be in this situation because he's like nine months at the start of this book and so i'm like Yes, he can talk like a full-grown adult, but he's a child. Like, he still can barely walk-walk. So, it's just, it's stressful for me, but it's so good. I read so much of this today. Like, I was on page 280-ish. Yeah, I was here, and I've read this much, and I'm about to go and read some more. But I just wanted to update you um, for this reading vlog, because I want to take you on the experience. Because this is fun, and I want to get people interested in reading these books because I have literally never heard anyone talk about Octavia E. Butler before um besides like a couple reviews on Goodreads and stuff and I just want more people to read her because she's the queen of science fiction and like Octavia E. Butler is awesome she's so great I, I don't know how else to say it she's just so good and I love adulthood right so far like it's it's so consumable I find that I prefer her sequels to her first books in the series, um, at least so far. That's been my experience with Earthseed and then Lilith's Brood, but I will keep you updated. So. Okay, so I just got out of the bathtub and I am now officially on part three of Adulthood Rights. And whew, part two, it was really intense, um, especially when there was a character whose name I think is Nessie or Neki. Um, I'm assuming it's Nessie though, because it's N E C I. Um, I did not care for her. There were two girls who um, had been kidnapped and then brought to Phoenix, and she wanted to cut off the tentacles. On their body and like the tentacles for the Owen Kali I, I was calling them the wrong thing last time the Owen Kali are like their sensory tentacles like they use them to see to feel to sting in case they need to kill you if you're attacking them they use them for all these things and so I am just I was so terrified for them because the thought of them cutting off these, they're like three and four years old, you guys. It, um, and I think they said their mom was from Ghana, their human mother. So all I could picture were these tiny little like black girls 
being tortured by a bunch of humans. And it reminded me a lot of, um, like, stories that I've heard, like, um, of female mutilation in Africa. And it kind of felt like Octavia E. Butler was kind of making some commentary on that. Um, but I would have to look into that more to know for sure. But considering that it would be, like, blinding them, um... I, it's just horrifying to even think that human beings would entertain doing that to toddlers to make them more human. <laughs> yeah, so if that doesn't give you a good perspective of like how disgusting the human beings are in this world, it's like you don't deserve to like continue. Um, but Akeen has been, he was at Phoenix for a year. And then part two ends with him being reunited with Lilith and Dichon, um, Nikanj, and Tino, and the other character whose name I cannot remember. Who is it? There's Nikanj, right? Yeah. Dichon. Who's the other one that's a part of their family? It starts with an A. I can't remember. Is it uh, Akaji, maybe? Um, I don't know. But reunited with the family. So I'm now on part three. You guys want to hear me attempt to pronounce part three? Okay. Chaka... Chadok. Chahakajok? Chahachachok. Chahachachok? Chahachachok. Chahachatik? Chahachachok. That's what I'm going to go with. <laughs> it looks like this. <laughs> I don't think I pronounced it correctly. Um, but I have an idea of what could be in this part. But I'm also, like, kind of nervous because I don't know. Like, what if Akeen feels separated from his real family after being with the people of phoenix for so long what if he becomes like this horrible human like mixture and he's just way too human and like all the best parts of who he is have been corrupted because he's been with them for so long oh it just worries me i'm just scared i'm nervous i'm so invested in his character um i do know that third book is it Imago or Imago? I'll have to look that up. But the third book, I know he's like, that follows a character that's like, super, like, mix. So, we'll see. I'm excited to figure out what a keen story is going to be, especially now that he's reunited with Lilith. And there was this really touching moment where she was like, I was scared that you would forget me and he just kind of like laughs because he's like I can't forget like he he, ha he has no way to forget his, his alien race never forgets a thing it's like a solely human characteristic and trait and I just I don't know I love that moment but it also hurt my heart because he was like I looked for her tears and I saw none and I was like oh he just wants his mom to like love him but Lilith is a very like strong willed I don't think she's cold um that's not the right adjective for her but I think it takes a lot for her to break down emotionally um but I do wish that she would have shed a tear for her son and meeting him again after be being reunited um because it's he's like three years old now by the time they meet again and the last time they saw each other, I think he was nine months old. So there's been a lot of time lapse. Um, but yeah, so far I'm still loving it. I have gotten to the point though where I'm scared I'll stop loving it because I've been in such a bad reading slump in March that I'm like, this is too good to be true. But fingers crossed, I'm blown away by adulthood rights. Hello. It's the next day. I am on page 445, chapter 5, in the Chahaka Chaduck. 
chat uh, part. Um, so interesting. I just wanted to do an update because part three is, I think, one of the shorter parts. Um, part three and part four are very short. Part two is like the bulk of um, adulthood rights, which I loved. I thought part one and part two were so brilliant. Um, so far, part three, not as good. So there were my fears coming to actually be true. Not that it's bad. It's just we have a major time hop. We go from Akin be Akeen being reunited with his family and then um we open up in the middle of this first chapter in part three and we're in um Dichon who is the male on Kali um father figure in the household his point of view and he's having a conversation with Tino and Tino has been um we learned that Tino's memories have come back after he had just been murdered or attempted to be murdered previously. Um, and he is struggling with feeling like he has abandoned humanity to choose to be a parent. Which interesting that we're getting some commentary on um, male fatherhood, which we kind of got at the beginning of this book when um, Akeen was first born he had heard a conversation and in that conversation they talked about how Akeen wouldn't really actually have any father like tendencies unless he chose to because it it seems like father like tendencies are not something that are natural like being a mother is natural to both human women and the on Kali females but um the males who are like human very rarely um stick around which ain't that the truth um for so many people in today's society and um uh, apparently the Owen Collie males are similar to that they like to not live a bachelor lifestyle but they're wanderers they like to wander and learn and um Akeen has both of those features intertwined in him and so we have this like 20 year old man who is not a man yet. He hasn't entered his metamorphosis. So we really don't know what he's going to look like. Um, and there's so much trauma between him and I, I'm totally going to say her, her name wrong uh, or their name wrong because they haven't assumed a gender yet. And I feel so bad for this character because um, I'm going to just call her them T because that's um kind of like the nickname they give T. T says that they want to be a male and they're like well if you go with Akeen on this ship um you will be female and it 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 kind of made me sad because this this character was so sad about it and there's been this trauma I don't know why I'm crying it's just I'm so attached to these characters like dang but there's this, been this complete trauma because Akeen and T were not able to bond like they should have as infants. And because they don't have this bonding of mates, there is this complete divide in their bond. And it's almost like they hate and resent each other. And it's so painful to read. And it makes me very uncomfortable because you can tell that neither of them feels comfortable being around each other but at the same time they don't want to not be around each other and it's just so sad and depressing and um i was looking up some stuff i was kind of like scouring through the peer review articles on um the exo xenogen i can never say it xenogenesis series because if you didn't know these books were published in like the 80s so i'm not really spoiling anything at this point most science fiction nerds have like read and consumed these books um although i do hope that more people in today's 2021 world will pick up these books because they're so brilliant um and even though they were written in the 80s they don't read old um, I was looking and I saw a lot of interesting stuff with um, commentary on col colonialism, which if we do read this novel where the aliens are, you know, colonizing humans, it, it's definitely that. Like, you can see it and it's uncomfortable to read and it's just 
there are times when you you feel this deep sorrow for the humans and then the humans kill somebody or rape someone and it's like never mind they deserve to be colonized but like when you look at humanity and the colonization of like humans colonizing other humans i never am on the side of the colonizers like i'm always like colonizers suck but in this case i'm like can like the humans just stop being horrible for one second like and they can't like they literally can't and at one point akeen he loves to go to the resistor villages as an adult and he likes to have sex with the women even though like he can't have children with them or anything but the women have this like absurd notion that if they have sex with a keen like they can reproduce and they don't which is very sad and tragic um so obviously a keen is like not um he's he's sexually interested but he's just not sexually interested in the way of reproduction yet and he's very scared of that like he's like i'm still too young for that that's terrifying i'm not ready i'm gonna go on the ship and i'm gonna have my metamorphosis and that's gonna happen and i'm not ready there's still so much i have to do but really they're going on the ship to learn about their um owen Kali roots um because they're like you know who you are as a human like you spent time with the resistors and he never went back to phoenix so i think we're gonna come full circle and somehow make our way back there which i'm curious about i'm also interested in the commentary that we had very briefly when akeen was talking about the resistor villages and his desire to learn all these languages of the humans how he encountered a completely english-speaking village and they would not allow him to stay because he was too dark-skinned and he was so confused because and embarrassed that he didn't ask the people of Lowe like why he was kicked out for being dark skinned. And it's just, it's sad to see that humans still can't get it. And like, even like at the very beginning of adulthood rights, I remember um, there was this one character and they said, we speak English, the true human language. And it's like, oh yeah, that's like such an Americanized like, thing to say and I'm pretty sure that character was actually from America so you know but it's interesting because there's so many like groups of resistors like they said there was Swahili ones Igbo um and just so many different languages that he can encounter but it's surprising that there are so many resistors I don't know I'm curious to see where this is gonna go um I have probably about 30 pages left in part three and i will update you when i'm done hello i have just finished part three of adulthood rights and i'm now on the last part home so as of now akeen was working with the akaji um which i'm still a little confused on what they are but it sounds like they are not sexless they're not an ulioi they're like above them um and akeen wants to essentially take the human resistors put them on a different planet that is not the earth and allow them to um continue reproduction um which would mean that they would be back to creating humans normally um and he is now he's been given permission to do this like a keen's new mission in life and this is what his whole life will consist of doing is creating this new planet for the humans to live on until the humans destroy it because like the akaji said that's exactly what's going to happen um no matter what that's just what's gonna happen but there will be like an akaji human there who's gonna like lead them help them guide them so it's interesting i like the direction it's going i like um the ulioi character that akeen and t um form a relationship with and i like that they're going to help akeen do this I liked a lot of the commentary in these later parts um, when it came to humans. Like, I put a lot of stars in this section. Because um, they continue to talk about how, like, the humans cannot survive. 
contradiction. And then Akeen was like, then let them fail. Let them have the freedom to do that, at least. Um, and there was one part where they said, someone, when when the Onkali were having this meeting, like, what should we do with the human resistors? Someone says, we've given them what we can of the things that they value, long life, freedom from disease, freedom to live as they wish. We can't help them create more life only to destroy it. And then um, at the end of this meeting, the Akaji tells uh, Akeem, he's like, if I were human, little construct, I would be a resistor myself. All people who know what it is to end should be allowed to continue if they can continue. And I don't know. It's just very profound stuff. And I really liked the second half of part three. Like, once they're on the ship, it's it's nice to be on the ship again. Like with all of the Onkali because we spent so much time there in Dawn um, and that was our first time doing that in adulthood rights so it was a very different experience for Akeen and T considering they're earth born um, and they've always been on earth they've never been on the ship so it was interesting and I'm going to read part 4 now home and part 4 is very short like not long at all, so I don't think this will take me long to finish at all. Hello, I have finished Adulthood Rights. I'm giving it five stars. The ending was so good. Oh, it was so intense. I love that um, Akeen goes back to Phoenix. I love that Tate and Gabe are not the same horrible people that they were at first and i really feel like adulthood rights gave them that transition that they needed i know imajo the third book follows i think his name is jodas or jo jodas yeah something like that and he is the first ever child born of a human who ends up becoming an ulioi and like I read the summary of the third book and like he'll be able to control things with the mind, metamorphose and change his shape and stuff like that. So that'd be cool. Um, Akeen actually, while he was human for most of his childhood, his um, metamorphosis was becoming an Onkoli, whereas most of the girls become human after their metamorphosis. Like, um, there is one of his sisters that he loves a lot, Margaret, if I remember her name. Yeah, I think it's Margaret. And it was so sweet, because at one of their, um, at their going away party in part three, she was like, look, I don't have seven fingers anymore. And then her skin turns brown um, after she completes it. And she's no longer gray like she had been her whole life. Where he's, he is gray and he looks completely like an on coley male um but i love the ending of adulthood rights i thought it was so poetic and it felt right and we have this hope of the colonization of humans on mars and it's just it's at a really good spot i i want to keep reading um the third book imago because i am not ready to leave this world and I want to know how this trilogy ends because Adulthood Rights was so good. It's definitely a five-star book. Like, I, I can't pinpoint anything that I hated about it. The very beginning of the third part was, like, the hardest part where I lost interest. But, like, that snag still wasn't even, like, anything to make this novel less beautiful because, whew, Octavia E. Butler she can write and she has me so attached to these characters even if um they're not big like yori the psychologist which if i remember correctly wasn't yori one of the people awakened by lilith and dawn i feel like yori was awakened by lilith but i can't remember but she plays a big part in phoenix and she is uh the psychologist yeah she definitely was awakened in dawn she's a psychologist who um, becomes like the doctor 
and she's like I have to go to Mars and when Akeen was like I want you to be on my human council I need humans to lead me in this decision and she was like I know who your mother is and um he was like yeah well if you know then you're definitely someone I want on my council and I just it's just moments like that that are so simple but have such a great emotional impact that make this series so good so can't wait to read the third book I'm excited I will check back in hello it's been a second since I've updated you on my progress with Imago um, which I think that's how you pronounced it I looked at the pronunciation of it and I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Imago um, so I am now officially on part two of the last book in this trilogy like I only have this much left that that much left it's like 140 pages left of Lilith's Brood and then I will have read an entire finished series by her which is so exciting because Earthseed is unfinished so the fact that I'm about to finish one of her series I'm like I don't know how this is gonna go I don't know if I'm gonna love it or if I'm gonna feel so many un inconclusive feelings I don't know because I've never read a conclusion from her before but I'm really excited. Um, so, I don't know, I can't remember what I've told you so far, but with Imago, we are following Jodas, and he is the first ever construct um, child between a human and an Onkali to become an Ulioi which means that he is essentially sexless. He is neither a male or a female um, on Kali. He is Ulioi completely. Um, and I'm at the part where his um, sibling and normally um, children will either become a male or a female when they're constructs because they haven't introduced the Ulioi's to them. And Jodas became a construct because he was very attached to Nakanj. And he sensed Nakanj's um, loneliness at not having any same-sex children. Um, because you're pretty much, like, attached to your same-sex parent. Like, if you become a boy, you're going to want to be with Tino or um, D-Chan. And if you're a girl, you're going to want to be with Lilith or Ahajus or Ahajus. So there's options and Akan is just kind of like there by himself. He never really had that kid to grow and spend that extra time with specifically because they're the same sex as him. And um, Jodas since that and he, he, not he, they, gotta correct myself because even though Jodas at the beginning said that he identified as male and he felt male as he progresses they become they right okay so it gets very confusing with the pronouns so i just try to say jodas or ulioi um because like what even pronouns would an ulioi use probably not they them these are the things that i think about because they're constructs like they don't need to be subverted by human pronouns why even are the constructs of the male and female on Kali called he and she? Because they're not human. They can have different pronouns. These are the things that I think about. Um, but again, this was written in the 80s. So we weren't there with pronouns and we're still not even really there today because the pronoun class is so very closed off. Um, and as someone who studied and took a couple like language classes with linguistics and stuff and grammar it's a closed word class which means it's so much harder to convince a general public of english speakers to adapt new pronouns which we saw and we're still seeing today it's getting more and more like traction and acceptance but like even just five years ago there was so much pushback against it so um it's interesting to think about though like what the little nuances would have changed to if um this book was written today which oh my god if 
Octavia E. Butler could have like written a novel today. And we have um, authors who are very similar to her in the science fiction realm. Like I would say N.K. Jemisin is probably the closest to her. I've only read a novella by N.K. Jemisin, but definitely a lot of similar um, societal topics, intersectionality, um, inclusivity, and deconstruction of um, hierarchies. So I can see their writing and how that's very similar. Um, but it would have just been a very interesting conversation to see this from a more modern lens. Because this is old, but it feels very ahead of its time. Like, it still reads relevant, um, and it's really good. Uh, I'm not going to spoil any of Jodas's plot, because I think that there are just some things that are important to experience through the reading process. And I feel like the Ulioi transformation that Jodas experiences is so complex that I would do a horrible job of even attempting to deconstruct it with my own voice. So I appeal to you to go read it yourself. I did however see something interesting and it kind of like blew my mind because I hadn't thought of it this way. But I think if I remember correctly, I saw someone on Goodreads uh, and I was just kind of like scrolling and you know how sometimes you scroll and you see something someone had said um it's interesting because the first book we have the human perspective the second book we have a m the first male construct um and then we have an ulioi the first construct and it's just fascinating to see all these different transitions um, it would have been cool to see it also from the female perspective, but from what I've seen with um, following adulthood rights, it really wouldn't have offered a, a layer to this trilogy that would have been expansive or helped. Um, and I think it would have hindered the overall story. So I'm glad that this wasn't like a quartet or a quintet, but three books, it, it fits. So I will update you. Hopefully, I can finish this tonight or tomorrow. Hello. I have officially finished the Lilith's Brood trilogy. I just finished Imago like an hour ago. I watched, um, after I finished it, I watched Kayla and Chandler's Instagram lives. And then I made pasta because they were making pasta. And I was like, now I want pasta. But, and I actually think I have some pasta stuck in my teeth still. Huh. That sucks. Anyway, so, Imago. I really loved the ending of this. I think Imago has a fantastic ending, um, genuinely. And there's such an important aspect that is being tackled in Imago when it comes to the ulioi constructs and how they are half human and then half onkali but they're ulioi and so they're this completely different race and um my favorite thing about imago is when we meet um jessa susa and what was the other guy's name i'm horrible with remembering names Justice Sousa. What is his name? It starts with like a T. What is it? What is it? No, that's someone else. I'm trying to find his... Tom Thomas, wow, or Tomas. But anyway, we meet these two characters and when Jodas meets them, he quickly realizes that there's something off with their genetic makeup. And I was all I was putting two and two together and I was like, okay, there can only be two potential things that these people are. One, they were like hidden and the own collie never noticed them and picked them up, and they've been like made horrible due to like nuclear fallout. Or number two, they 
are some sort of messed up genetic breeding, which would have been impossible. Well, it turns out their genetic breeding was messed up. One of the resistors who's not supposed to have children had like 13 of them. And with all that came um, like this one genetic mutation that um, caused a variety of issues. So like there's tumors that grow on people. Some people are um, born dwarf, some are born hunchback, some are born with like um, scales on their skin. So there's like a wide variety of um, birth defects in this small community that is living in the mountains away from the resistors um, who refuse to go to Mars and have babies there or refuse to have children with their own collie. So this completely new group of people and also we come across like two characters at the end who are part of Lilith's first group that she wakes up and it was so nice to see their opinions change and one of the most profound moments at the end is when Francisco one of the elder resistors who says like if there had been someone like you Jodas I don't think I ever would have been a resistor um and even Lilith at the end, she's like, Jodas, there's something special about you because these people don't just follow you, they love you. And I don't know, I thought it was really profound, really beautiful, um, because like Jodas is basically just what humans could be um, and the hope for this new humanity now that humans no longer exist, but they get to live on and someone like Jodas or um, his, their Leo sibling named A, 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 R, A, C, O, R, I don't know. I'm horrible with names and this book has very fancy spelling names. So obviously I'm not doing good with that, but to sum it all up, the ending was beautiful. It fit. It says like, hey, this is where we're ending, but this is where we're going. And this is how we can all come together. And like, yeah, there's probably still horrible resisting humans out there, but I'm not worried about them because this new group that they bring into them are comfortable and wanting to join with the Onkali or go to Mars. And more often than not, these people who have seen what the birth defects um, were like, they have chosen to stay and take Onkali mates and Ulioi constructs. Cause apparently there's like more Ulioi constructs coming. So ended beautifully. I loved it. Do I prefer this to Earthseed? Yes, um, Imago. I think I'm going to give it five stars. Yeah, I'm going to give it five stars. I preferred this to Earthseed just because I loved the alien aspect. Like, I'm going to be completely honest. Like, this was so cool. It was so fascinating. I loved it. I have, like, so many profound thoughts that I will probably never be able to verbally speak. And I just... I love this book. I love this trilogy. I love what Octavia E. Butler was saying about gender, humanity, politics, um, class systems, hierarchies, um, rape, assault, violence. I, I appreciate all that she sets out to do in this trilogy. And I think that while she may fall short in some aspects, she overcompensates in many more. And it's a brilliant trilogy. Um, and where would science fiction be without Octavia E. Butler, you know? She was the first ever black woman to reach major acclaim in science fiction. So I think the whole genre would be very different without her, um, especially with leaving an imprint like this. And I also have, I have all of her books, but I do have the um, Seed of Harvest. Seed to Harvest, which has four books of the Patternist 
um series but it doesn't have survivor and i am hunting down survivor i want to own all of octavia e butler's books even the one that she pulled from publication because i want them all gosh darn it i want one day to go to the archives at that university that house her archival material and her writings and i want to see that i want to experience it that's what i want no i don't want ice cream thank you yeah so um maybe i do want ice cream i don't know <laughs> no i just ate pasta i don't eat that <laughs> okay so yeah i loved it i think it's amazing i obviously recommend it i don't think i spoiled you too badly and if i did I'm sorry, why were you watching this <laughs> spoiler reading vlog? <laughs> um, if I did spoil you and you're still interested, definitely read it. It is a classic, so um, it's worth reading, definitely. So let me know down below what you think of Lilith's Brood or Xenogenesis. Let me know your favorite aspects, your least favorite aspects. Let me know which Octavia E. Butler book is your favorite and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you down below in the comments. Bye and happy reading.